I think it's really important to start with the premise that you're deluded and it is really easy to be glib or flippant or not present or not connected to the truth of what we're doing and why we're doing it. So I decided to critically analyze everything that I was doing and I started from the principle that it was flawed and inaccurate and damaging and dangerous. It was a lot of ego. And, and in ego, my ego turned up in people pleasing and being a nice guy and not ruffling feathers and, and making people like me. My work focuses really on a key specialism of mine, which is around imposter syndrome, self-sabotage. Sabotage comes from a very specific part of us and that part blocks our ability or blocks our ability to enjoy things. And when you speak to that part, you can turn it around and it changes everything. So I say to investors, like, go to your founders and ask them, Pay them a compliment and see if they shirk it. Because if they shirk it, they're going to mess up your project and you're going to lose your money. They have a part inside that doesn't want them to feel good. Frozen parts of your brilliance, your creativity, your excellence. When you understand that everything that's happened to you is training for who you are destined to become, life becomes a gymnasium for your soul. Yes, it involves looking at your trauma. Get the fuck over it. And that makes you more money. It makes things more easy. It takes the strain off your heart. It, it makes everything better. Welcome everyone to a new episode of the Way Showers podcast. Today, I have you as my guest, Tom, and you are Tom Fortes Meyer is an international speaker, leadership mentor, founder of the Future Foundation Think Tank, author of two books on psychology, and a father of four. And I remember you very well from 2011 when you stripped bare in a room on the Isle of Wight as we were <laughs> as we were exploring our masculinity together in a workshop and and you just chose to share everything and I don't think I can ever forget that moment it was it was one of those moments like I I remember this man for the rest of my life so <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> so that's a good start. Uh, yeah, that's a good introduction. Yeah, yeah. And it, it wasn't necessarily the typical space where that was exactly, it was completely welcome, but it was not of the norm. It was quite surprising. So, yeah, not in the least to me, also. So, there we go. Had to be done. Yeah. I mean, it was, uh, it, it made an impact, shall we, shall we say? It, it was good. Oh, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I well, hope I didn't mangle your name. And please say it again if I got the last name wrong. Oh, it's fine. It's Tom Fortismayer. You did a good Fortismayer. job, and, uh, and I'm yeah. and I'm really pleased to be here. It's uh, it's uh, you know, it was a pleasure getting to know you then, and it's a real joy to be here today. Nice. Yeah. So I'm curious about two phases of your life that I picked up on in conversations with you previously. Mm -hmm. And something that you've been talking about on your TEDx talk and, of course, every life, every man's life is you have these key moments where things change in a dramatic way. And I would love for you to just bring us back some 20, 25 odd years and, and tell us what got you propelled onto the path of personal growth. Mm. Yeah, so I... I was, um, I guess the simplest way of describing me was I was lost without realizing, right? I thought I was having a great time. I was kind mm. of looking for happiness in all the wrong places in all the wrong ways. But for me, it was working. You know, I was, I was pretty happy. I was pretty free. I was, you know, it's just a wild headness. I didn't have any belief in, in anything deeper in life. I thought I had a pretty pragmatic, practical, atheistic view of life. And mm. therefore there was no meaning to anything other than just have the most fun you can, you know, try to be a decent human. Don't willfully hurt people along the way. But it was a very basic philosophy of hedonism. And I threw myself into it wholeheartedly. Um, but at 27, without any seeking or any kind of spiritual practice, I had a single event epiphany where I felt profoundly connected to all things and, and the deepest sensation within me as a natural state of my being was one of profound uh, love and extraordinary mm. happiness. Was this and, a spiritual experience or were you just like happy? No, I mean, it was profoundly spiritual, but I didn't really have any context for it. Uh -huh. um, so when I tried to tell my friends about it, I heard from other friends that I'd found God, which to me at the time was still preposterous because... I still considered myself an atheist, but I now realize I just had a very limited idea of divinity. Um, you know, there were no beards on thrones involved. So it didn't, uh, you know, it didn't fit my narrow definition of what I thought the divine was. But 
now I can obviously have a much deeper understanding of the perennial philosophy and it was a completely spiritual experience. Um, and yeah, my, my life was completely changed because the thing that had led to my epiphany was a whole bunch of practical things. And the epiphany itself was, was, was based on a very practical experience. And so I became obsessed with two things. One, natural happiness, because I just experienced it, and it was better than anything I'd ever found in various pills and potions I'd taken previously. Mm. And epiphanies, like rapid transformation, because I was walking, talking evidence that someone's life could be changed in one moment. And it was practical. So I spent the last 23, 24 years trying to work out how to help other people have those paradigm-shifting moments. Mm -hmm. And... My sense was that while that was a profound spiritual experience for you, and I mean, I've, I've heard you speak of this as a very momentous occasion that basically has shaped the, the, the remaining half of your life. But I can tell that something more has changed for you over the last year or so. Yeah. Because so you're less polished. You're more like raw than you used to to be yeah you know i still had you know it's been a lot of you know they say after the xc now the laundry and i've had my fair share of laundry to process but really the last couple of years specifically the last year yeah i've had more no kind of whiz bang aha moments uh actually more like hitting rock bottom and just been like mm having to, to find some metal inside myself and stand tall and stand strong from a place of absolutely uncertainty and surrendering mm. into a deeper faith. And in that, finding myself anew, but in a very, a very solid way, Ma hugely about my masculinity. I think, I think you could simply say that so much of the personal development I, I followed and that I needed was feminized spirituality mm, and I yeah. became more emotionally intelligent. I became better at communicating. I became better at holding space for my woman's fluctuating emotions. I was taking <laughs> all the right, right, right guy, nice guy, spiritual stuff. Right. And there's huge mm. value in that, but somewhere along the way, coupled with some, you know, I'm, I'm not good enough for my mummy's love trauma. You know, I lost my power my masculine mm. solidity. And mm. this last year I've been rediscovering that essentially I was out of integrity in a number of ways, particularly in how I talked about my work. Um, so there's a huge spiritual part of my work. And, but because mm. I was so concerned about the cynic that I used to be, I used to consider myself this bridge builder for people that didn't have any kind of spiritual faith. And I would, present it in ways where I'd never even use the word spiritual and I would yeah. win them over. And then when I really had their trust and they really knew that I could really help them and I'd already helped them ex extraordinarily. So then I would bring in this kind of spiritual element of my work. Mm. And I realized last year, I was like, wow, you're really, um, you're not being honest. You're not in your integrity about who you are and what you stand for. And so that was a significant part of the process for me. And it was because I was always afraid that my profoundly atheistic father would, I'd lose my father in being that open and honest about the spiritual aspect of my work. He brought me up to feel sorry for anyone with any kind of spirituality. He brought me up to think that anyone with any kind of faith was pathetic. Right. Well, that's so, heavy baggage. Especially yeah, and I would, uh, spiritual. Yeah. But what's interesting is so just as a magical moment, so it wasn't a big whiz bang moment, but it was a beautiful symmetry. As I kind of came out of the closet, kind of a year ago, I wrote this really long post calling all the things I'd called myself quantum psychologist, all these different names, you know, all these different attempts to kind of brand myself. Mm. And uh, then I said, what am I now? And I was like, I'm bored. I'm bored of pretending one thing and doing another. So this is me being honest about, the, 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 the divine in my work about my relationship with God and how it underpins everything that I do. And my father and I, we've worked hard to have a, a, a good relationship as good as possible, but it doesn't involve him really calling me very often. And, and, and that night he read that post and he called me that night 
and shared with me that he was actually returning to and discovering a spiritual side of his life. And it was really my greatest fear, my greatest fear that the exact opposite happened. So for me, I was like, all right. Tom, that's now incredible. I, beautiful, huh? I What's mean, on the story to tell about your dad? Yeah, it was beautiful. Yeah. And, you know, he was always incredibly hearty and full of love and all the best aspects of a decent human, you know. But mm. that, that, to me, you know, I feel sorry for the younger version of me that didn't have a relationship with reality. I understood the true nature of consciousness. Mm. And I think it's really important. And I think if you look at the troubles of the world, the simplest answer is we're in deep, profound spiritual crisis. Yeah. I want to spend a significant chunk of time on this last year of yours because it's clearly been very formative. And I mm -hmm. think in terms of the audience for this podcast is probably that's the sweet spot of our conversation. But I yeah. don't want to just jump over 20 years of your life that were super important. So when you say my work, what are you talking about? So because I became obsessed with happiness and epiphanies, I having you could be prior to 27 school had never appealed to me. I'd never found the thing that lit me up. You could count the amount of books that I'd read at the age of 27 on two hands, right? I had an empty brain. I had a good brain, but it was empty. You know, I'd avoided, my father was also American. My mum was brought up in South America. I didn't have any, I never felt British. I, I didn't I didn't relate to any culture. I was completely blank slate. And I now realize what a gift that was. Because then suddenly I had this incredible, voracious appetite for learning. And so yeah. I just have really since then been on a mission studying philosophy, psychology, spirituality, anything that that um helped me understand what it is to live free, uh, abundantly and happy, mm -hmm. successful, uh, good and decent. Uh, and whatever mechanisms create that transformation. So mm -hmm. fascinated in transformational experiences, paradigm shifting ideas, tools, techniques. So I didn't, I didn't go and start studying that stuff because I wanted to become a therapist. But what I discovered when I was learning about all this stuff was in my epiphany, I'd realized that our natural state is one of happiness and love. And that much of our modern world makes that really difficult to experience consistently. Mm -hmm or mm. ever for many people. Mm. And so I began to realize that actually most people were having a healthy response to an unhealthy world. Yet in those places I was learning, it was still built on the old Victorian idea around mental health, these Freudian principles. It's like, let's glue people back together and get them back out on the treadmill, like the treadmill's good. And I was like, hold on a minute, people are using these powerful transformational tools, but they're confirming a worldview which is actually causing the problem. Yeah. So I got me thinking, and I was like, if I went into private practice and you actually supported people's resistance to what is and got them to try and find a way to live free within this, like, reality, would that be more effective? And so, again, I just I started, I started helping people, and before I knew it, I had a very, very busy kind of private practice and, yeah, was off on my way. I'd spent years you know, running parties and I was a nightclub promoter and a rave promoter. And, you know, suddenly I had a meaningful job and I disappeared into it. And so for many, many years I was, yeah, doing that, particularly around the themes of rapidly resolving trauma and negative limiting beliefs. Mm -hmm. And so I've loved that. I've absolutely loved that. And I still do that work, but now with a, with a very different focus. So before I'd work with anybody and everybody, now I just work with change makers, so to leverage my time. So I'm working with people who are going out to do beautiful, brilliant, amazing things to make the world better. Yeah. And I focus on helping them because then I get there's much more leveraged good in what I'm doing, which I love. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's massively about reflecting. So I'm drawing on all those 23, 24 years of experience, but it's really looking at this last year for me has been about my integrity, my power a man my responsibility as a man you know i had one client say to me i was encouraging him to really get out there and charge you know way more for his keynotes and and he's amazing 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 author and thinker and he was like oh i don't know the world doesn't need more middle-aged white men on stages like telling people how to live and i was like yeah it does it does what it needs is good men it needs good 
honorable like we need examples of like white middle-aged men who are honorable like mm. deeply honorable and have a have a great integrity and they're inspiring we need men of all colors doing that it's not suddenly we only need like black lesbians on stage because there's no place for white men anymore it's like that's the worst way of thinking we need loads of great black lesbians too but it's not that we don't need we it's not not having white men it's having decent white men that's mm. what the world needs that's the world's crying out for mm. and so yeah it's um it's about honor and for me when i really started diving deep into integrity i was like wow there's financial integrity, there's emotional integrity, there's relational integrity, there's consent integrity, there's fraternal integrity. There's just, there's so much depth to it, so many pieces to how we need to clean things up. Mm. Mm. Great. And yeah, that sounds great. And I love the way that you just nip that in the bud and say, no, of course we need you. And, and, and to be in the place of actually uh, raising the bar of what he sees himself as in the world. Cause I like, maybe that was his little imposter syndrome that, that was rearing its head. It's like, no, I'm tired of hearing my own voice voice. I mm -hmm. saying the same things over and over. Who cares? You know, I, I, I I've yeah. been in places, like, I've been in places like that. I'm saying yeah. the same goddamn keynote over and over. And why, why does the world need more of this? But of course, <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. Because there's so much dysfunctional behavior out there. Yeah. And our leadership, generally speaking, on the global stage is appalling. Yeah. 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 And, 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 you know, and, and it's not about being a polished, perfect human. You know, I, you know, it's like I've struggled. I've, you know, I'm separate from her. children with other women. You know, it's like four kids, blended family. You know, it's been messy whilst I've been mm. finding my way and working through my trauma and making mistakes and being human. I remember I had a crisis of faith before going on stage some years back. I was like, who the hell are you to like have authority or tell anybody? Or, you know, it's like, look, you're from a failed marriage and, you know, it's, and I, I went on stage that night with a very different commitment, not to stand up there all polished and shiny and perfected and looking like I've got everything under control, but actually as someone who understands how hard it can be to be human, how hard it can be to make relationships work, how painful it is when they don't. And I spoke from a place there where I wasn't an authority. I was just a human who's like, who, who, who wants to share things with other humans so that they think really, they think and they feel for appropriately long amounts of time to really make well-considered choices because, you know, actually we do only get one life and it is really easy to be glib or flippant or not present or not connected to the truth of what we're doing and why we're doing it. And in that we can make terrible choices that have lifelong consequences, not just for us, but for all the people that we love and the generations to come. And it's like, everything needs to be way more considered. And of course it's incredibly, People think that's about being honest with ourselves. It's almost impossible to be honest with yourself unless you are putting extraordinary amounts of effort into understanding how you came to be who you are, how you operate and why, and, and, and becoming conscious of the previously unconscious things that are driving 90% of our behaviors. Mm -hmm. Self-knowledge is, is, involves a deep understanding of psychology. So, yeah. So your, your, your claim is that you can't be honest unless you have deep and penetrative self-awareness. Yeah, because mm. you just don't know why you're doing what you're doing. So you don't actually know the truth of you. How many people are honest in your estimation? I, I, th I think, I mean, psychologists have done experiments to prove that everybody lies. And mm. as I have made a commitment to try and not to lie in my life, it has been harrowing to see how often I would lie. <laughs> Just, you know, like I'm running 10 minutes late and I'll send them a text message. I'm running five minutes late. Or like, why do that? Like, like it ameliorates the annoyance. Then I'll send another text message. Oh, oh, it's going to be five minutes more. It's just all these cajoly ways in which I try and lubricate social process with bullshit, you know? And it's like weeding that out has been terrifying, to be honest with you. And, yeah. and still noticing it because, you know, and... And, uh, and often not even necessarily because it's self-serving, but because I'm 
I'm making up my mind about what I think is best for other people, you know, lubricating other people's experiences of themselves. But I now realize that actually mm -hmm. that truth and love are synonymous and that the shape of the fabric of reality is the only thing that we can reflect. And if you start twisting the fabric of reality, then no one knows where they are. And no mm. one knows the truth of how to be. It's like the only thing that triangulates us in present reality from which we can make the right choices is the truth. Mm. And, and it's not a decision. It's a practice. It's a practice to deepen our awareness, you know? Right. Hmm. So truth is a practice, telling the truth. And it's a humbling yeah, it and confronting practice. Yeah, you you know, <laughs> he has to start. I think it's really important to start with the premise that you're deluded, that you're half blind, <laughs> and that many <laughs> and that many of the theories and beliefs, and principles and practices that form like the central part of your belief system are at least flawed in some ways mm -hmm. that you do and don't know. Yeah. You know, I when COVID happened, I took that opportunity. Uh, I had some pretty tough feedback on some of the training I was doing then. I was training therapists then. I had some pretty tough feedback and I had a, a first of all, quite a defensive response to it. Not to them, actually. I managed to pretend to be civil, but internally I found it very painful and my ego was quite wounded. And, and I realized how unhelpful that was. And I thought to myself, I want to hold myself to a higher standard. So I decided to critically analyze everything that I was doing and I started from the principle that it was flawed and inaccurate and damaging and dangerous. So I sat all of my principles down, laid them on the altar, and I decided to presume they were flawed. And oh, it was a hell of a it was a hell of an experience. And I'm and proud that's to shadow say, work. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people do shadow work on their character, but do they do it on their like core professional and personal beliefs? Yeah. Yeah. You know? and, yeah. And, and in the main, you find out about the danger of your work. How how yeah. was your how was your yeah. work dangerous for others? Yeah, I did. I I, I realized that I wasn't being conscientious enough about mm. making assessments about the people for which it was suitable. That there are right. a certain subset of people with a certain set of conditions for which it's not really appropriate, right. and um, and that I should be better at screening those out. And it was like, oh, oh, well, that one's familiar. Really good. Yeah. I can see that one too. Like I, yeah. I ended up having men on the reclaiming a throne initiation back in the days that clearly shouldn't have been there. Mm. You know, the interview process hadn't revealed the things that came out after like two months. Um, so I, th I think this thing that you're pointing to there is also one of those journeys that most people in this field have to go on because initially we start out being kind of desperate for clients and so we just want <laughs> any, we just want totally. anyone right totally like, yeah true totally. like oh yeah, somebody's yeah. willing to pay me like i don't care yeah. if it works or if it, you know and then i think gradually you have to weed out this bullshit that um that separates the new age fluffy idiots from from actual professionals in the field yeah, definitely. And, and you know, and price is a massive part of that. Now for my one-on-one -on -one coaching, I charge a huge yeah. amount of money. And that's an incredible filter for a certain type of character, which means I just don't right. need to worry about a whole bunch of other things. You know, and I have my other, like, social enterprise, which enable and democratize mental health, and it makes it affordable. So I can sleep at night. I do both. And I'm excited about that. But um, it feels really, really good to be boundaried and to know where, I, where I'm best placed and where my work works and where it doesn't. And yeah. aside from that, there were also some, 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 some aspects that needed to be rethought. And I changed, you know, there were six, I believe there are six um, kind of tools of transformation, really. And all the work that I've done, I believe there are really six tools of transformation. And, and, and there are lots of tools that sit within that. So you could list a hundred tools, but I would be able to put them into essentially six categories. And, um, and, and how I'd articulated that and how I'd explained that to myself, um, wasn't as crisp as it should have been. And so there was a whole bunch of things. And, and then I, I sat back mm -hmm. and I had this really, I had three pillars 
upon which all success and happiness are built. And then there were two techniques of transformation. And suddenly I had this really robust, fully considered model. Is this um, about you becoming honest with, with your audience? Is that what you're talking about? Like you were unclear about what it is that you were doing for them or? Well, the whole process, the whole process just meant I started, it coincided me with me doing these regular, she called them TV shows, but they were on, she was broadcasting them on a variety of different social media platforms. But there's this okay. brilliant yeah. woman called Jess Clare, who, okay. uh, who had an audience in Australia. And even though we broadcast it to my, my network here, hardly anyone tuned into it. So it coincided with, I made this commitment that I was just going to be ferociously honest on this thing in ways that I'd never been before. And, um, and I didn't realize that actually when I'm angry, I get funnier. And so I would purposefully get angry about the state of the world. And then I jump on these calls with her. It's, and I would is this find before my, your change uh, to, to more masculine, raw, raw this expression? About, this, was, this was kind of all part of it. So over that last kind of uh -huh. year, two years. So you've just, just been getting a lot more honest. A lot more honest. Yeah. A lot more honest about what I believe and a lot more honest about my own flaws. And I've been having a better sense of humor. And I've been really... <laughs> Good. blowing up this idea that I have to be this perfect authority. It's like, I know loads of shit about how to have a better life. And I am, you know, and I'm, and, and, and my journey towards that has been messy. I'm recovering from a lot of weird trauma and, and my life has reflected that. And yet dragging myself out of those holes, I've learned a lot. I've got a lot to share, but yeah, on, on, on an average Tuesday, I can be a right mess still. <laughs> So, so tell me, it's like, how, how old exactly were you when you had the first breakthrough? Like 22 or something? Just uh, 27. Oh, it was 27, yeah, right? So gonna, Sorry, yeah, 27. I was 27 and then, then. So I'm going yeah. 50 this year. Oh, wow, you're getting on, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 45 now. Like, so it. <laughs> <laughs> Soon you'll be an elder, my friend. <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that. I'll grow a beard, pretend I'm wise. It's going to be great. Yeah, but it's, it's much better, isn't it, to have the wisdom of, of years rather than be in that place of trying to prove yourself to the world. I prefer it anyway. But you're 27 years old and you have this breakthrough, but so, so it's, it's huge, it's spiritual, mm -hmm. you're happy. But somehow, somewhere along the way, it just turns out that there was something in that revelation, shall we say, that, that was missing. And so, so what, what do you think was missing and, and how do you find yourself in this place that all of a sudden you're not, you don't have integrity, you don't speak the truth? Is that, is that the niceness you were speaking about or is it something else? I think, I think, you know what, it's like, not that I was making mistakes. I think if you would look, I think on a trajectory across those 20, you know, three years since then, I've been doing better in almost every area of my life up, you know, right. it's, it's going up, but it's, it's doing that along the way, but mm. it's like, and I was committed to being honest and open then, but I just had still was packed full of trauma that was bending me out of shape. There was still mm. the desire to be validated. I still, you know, I went from being addicted to su seducing women and being like a love addict, a validation addict being addicted to helping people and to have people saying good job tom and you know and yeah you know and all of that stuff so i just moved over you know i was probably one of the most important books i think anyone should read is cutting through spiritual materialism by chogram trungpa and it's mm. like it's unbelievable because it makes you realize that you just you just transplanted your egotism from material things onto spiritual things. And he calls it spiritual materialism. And you're like, oh, man, now I want to go to yoga and touch my toes quicker and find the perfect teacher, and have the perfect six pack and, you know, have lots of people sitting around me going, oh, aren't you wise? It's like still ego. So I was a lot of ego. And, and in ego, my ego turned up in people pleasing and being a nice guy and not ruffling feathers and, and making people like me. And, um, yeah. and yet for me, you know, when I started discovering Tantra and realized that my nice guy actually meant people trusted me less, which was an yeah. absolute revelation. Were you a snag? Snag? What's a snag? Sensitive new age guy. Oh yeah. I mean, proudly so totally. Yeah. <laughs> 
I gaze with the best of them, you know, and <laughs> pretend to be super sensitive. And, you know, this is you know, one of the things that creeps me out more than anything when somebody locks eyes with me and doesn't let go in this like weirdly overly intimate <laughs> way. It's like, yeah, I didn't cool. invite you in. <laughs> like, what? Yeah. yeah, no, it's deeply intimate. You may as well just pinch yeah. someone. That's the new age version of pinching someone's ass, right? It's just like, <laughs> yeah. it's fine to make good eye contact, but to hold your hands, not release to you instead. <laughs> like, it's like, how much of your shit have you dealt with? Because whoever blinks first is a loser. You know, it's like. <sighs> you know, there's something, there's something about a person that is happy all the time that I find deeply unsettling. Mm-hmm. I don't trust them for shit. Yep. And yep. it's like, there's almost like a horror movie vibe over them for me. It's like, so what kind of like sociopathic spare time activities are you up to? <laughs> Just mainly suppression, right? I mean, this is the thing I realized that you can use spiritual practices in the way that people use beer. You know, it's like yeah. you can meditate to push down your trauma. You can you can do yoga to try and be a decent human. And it's like you're right. But, you know, it's like freedom is not the absence of fucking madness. You know, it's it's about having a much more loving relationship with our insanity and being open and honest. But this human experience is is wild, you know, and it's not easy and it's not meant to be easy. People have this idea, I'm going to integrate and I'm going to be better and therefore my life is going to be easier. It's like, you just need to let go of that idea. It's going to be easier. It might be more fulfilling. It might be richer. It may well have deeper beauty in it. But it's like, don't strive for it to be easier. That's the wrong question. That's the wrong compass. Yeah. And, and, and the truth is, if you're in the game and you're in the arena and you're trying to do something important, as a father, as a as a husband, as a as a business person, or even as a, as an employee in an awesome organization, or an employee in a non awesome organization trying to make it more awesome, it's going to be ferociously difficult at times. And yeah. if you're not being honest about those challenges, I had it today. You know, my partner she pissed me off last night because we've been having quite a bit of tension. And I went to bed last night, and she just I walked in the room, and she had another thing she was pissed off about. And I just wanted to say, for fuck's sake, you know, can we not just, can you not just shelve that? We could cover this in a, in a meeting a week from now just to give us seven days peace or something. And I woke up this morning really annoyed with her for that reason. It's like, mm. why did you have to bring that to me? And we could have just, you know, she's the woman, she's holding it, she's feeling it, she's going to bring it, and she's committed to that. <laughs> she, she makes no apology for that. And... And yet this morning I was therefore annoyed, tender and frustrated. And I actually found myself here. Here's a, here's a, a letter which I had to send. I had to sign off on a massive share transfer to someone in, in the business. We, I got investors in for a mental health app. And mm. I thought all my dreams were coming true with this. And it actually ended up being a nightmare. And that is a massive transfer of my shares in my in, tw in 23 years of my work, handing over almost control to someone who I feel has actually made it not work because it's the only way I can break free and get out of an exclusivity cause. And it's a massive piece of grief. And had I not had that moment of pain and not woken up in a tender enough spot, I could probably have signed that and pretended I was okay. But actually she reminded me that this is a really important deal. And that if I'm feeling annoyed, there's probably something happening, which I need to honor. And sure enough, I tapped into it and I'm heartbroken. I'm really annoyed. I'm really angry. I feel, I feel really frustrated about it. And I know it's all part of a wider plan and I can feel the benefit and I can see the beauty in it. And my human is really upset about it. And I, and I was able to connect with that upset. And not from a place of victimology, not from a place of misery. Actually, by being able to feel it, I could just heal it and allow that integrate. And now I'm because more determined. Because of your conflict with your wife? Is that what you're saying? The conflict helped. It tenderized me to uh -huh. be able to feel it. You know, the masculine can just put its armor on and just bypass its emotions. And it's not about being feminized and just being a wet mess all the time. It's about being able to, f being actually courageous enough to feel your tenderness. And now yeah. it's like, I've learned a lot. I had to sign something here. I was wrapped up in a contract. Yeah, I felt this deal before was so sweet and it was ordained and it was perfect and it was synchronistic. And yet 
I could have been way more robust in how I protected myself. I could have had way more legal barriers in place. We had robust contracts, but I didn't, we, we set that up as a business for all of us, but I didn't have external lawyers look at how I was protected within that. It's ridiculous. I'd never make that mistake again. And it's mm. like, so for me, it's like, I take strength from that upset. That fury informs my power, my boundary. It's important. All of the human emotions are important. Being a powerful man doesn't mean not feeling your emotions, nor does it mean being subsumed by them and being a wet mess for four months, you know? So let's, uh, let's focus a bit more in on what you do now then, because you were doing all of this mental health, happiness work. You were helping people yeah. heal their traumas quickly and you were putting on all kinds of events where you were taking them into like a, like a self-help clubbing environment uh, and, yeah. and unless I'm mistaken. Mm -hmm. um, and um, hypnosis raves, technically. Hypnosis raves. Yeah. I don't yeah. think I've ever been to one. So it's, it is quite unique. <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah. And we ran for like three years in London on a Saturday night. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Successful. People came. I mean, successful in the fact that many other people tried to run sober raves on a Saturday night and failed within two events. So yeah, we, We did really well. We had an average 100, 150 people every time. And we ran for three years. It was great. Um, Good but, on you, man. Yeah, it was, and it was amazing. I tr to be honest with you, it was another one of my laboratories. Years ago, I'd gone on Anthony Robbins' Unleash the Power Within in 2004. Mm. And he'd taken us from meditating and lying down and crying to celebrating. Um, I didn't like the music, you know, and I was dancing around to Tina Turner, Simply the Best. But... I was like, you could do this in a really cool way. But I felt I didn't have the facilitation skills to take people from meditating and healing and crying and laughing and then celebrating. And so I wanted to develop my skills to be able to do that, which I did. Mm. Sweet. And now you don't do that stuff anymore, at least not in the same way. You're working with change makers. You're working with as far as I understand, high-level men. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Do you only have um, male clients now? No, I, I work with I work with some women, so I don't I don't yeah. rule out, but because of the level I work at, and that it's eighty percent men, and and the work is not different for men or for women, um, which is lovely to see, and mm. in, in many ways, you know, I still use my three pillar approach, which is about helping people have more inner peace connect to their power and connect to their purpose more. And yeah. and the six techniques of transformation that I've developed in these 23 years, I still use that. So the model's mm -hmm. the same, but the focus is different and the level of dedicated care is different. I work with maybe seven or eight clients in a year and they come and mm -hmm. see me once a month for a whole day. I work with a body worker. Um, uh, to, so we're working on mind, body and soul. They, um, they get a weekly call from me when they're not coming to see me in that week. I spend time contemplating them. I sending them resources. There's, it's just a completely different level of dedicated care. And it's a massive investment of their time and money. It's, um, mm. you know, I was helping a lot of business owners make a lot more money. And mm. I realized when I was doing 15 or 20 sessions a week, I was still doing really good work, really solid work, but I wasn't doing anywhere near my absolute best. So right. for me now, my working week involves me spending the morning meditating, preparing, getting into alignment, going to the gym, just like getting in the absolute optimal state. And right. then I get to work with these incredible people doing incredible things. It's cool. So something so happened. Me. Yeah. Something happened. You became more masculine, shall we say. How yeah. many multiples of like – increase of your prices and revenue resulted mm -hmm. from you actually having that raw gateway into your masculinity oh yeah i mean how many 300 percent. so you 3x your income from that yeah and i was already six figures so that's pretty it's pretty good going you know yeah yeah it was it's been that incredible it's been incredible yeah And, 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 and helping people 
do that and more in their own business has just been extraordinary you know so when you're working with people who own a business and they can have those that growth it, paying those kind of fees makes sense if they can see that they have massively increased their earnings beyond what it costs so it's like mm -hmm. i finally move beyond someone saying oh what do you cost for an hour and it's like no 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 no, no. it's nothing to do with an hourly cost it's like yeah. you make the comparison to how much extra you're going to earn and not just about what you're going to earn, how much better you're going to be in your relationship with your partner, with your kids. It's like that has a completely different value set. But what I've seen is when people invest this kind of money, the difference in how they turn up, how they listen, how they follow your guidance, it's been incredible. It's been incredible. Mm -hmm. I've never, I was always get. I, I got good results before, but now the results are fundamentally different. Are the themes that you work on with these more high level men different from the themes you worked on with like the more, it's a, it's maybe a slightly on PC, but let's just say the more low level men, <laughs> you know, it's like there is a hierarchy of achievement in this world. It just is. And yeah, yeah. do you find that there have different challenges? Well, I mean, you have to understand. So within this, my work focuses really on a key specialism of mine, which is around imposter syndrome, self-sabotage. Mm. And um, when someone is operating with that, and you can tell if someone's operating with that because they push away compliments, they attract unavailable or dysfunctional partners, uh, they struggle with addictions, um, or when things are going well, they, mm. feel like, they feel like an imposter or or it doesn't really give them any satisfaction or it's, or, you know, I spoke with a client who did a raise of 23 million, giving his company a valuation of 300 million. And he's on, he's on, he's set to be at a billion pound valuation within a couple of years. And I said mm. to him, when you raise that 23 million, giving your company a valuation of like a, nearly a third of a billion, you know, third of a unicorn, how long did it feel good for? And he paused for a moment and I was like three days. And he went, too <laughs> it's like because that's not where fulfillment comes from you know and it's like no matter what what we set or what we think this time next year when i get that and it's just like that's just not where fulfillment comes from fulfillment doesn't come from the external things we achieve it comes from the person we're becoming as we achieve mm -hmm. them mm -hmm. and a lot of people don't even notice that so they're actually doing that they're becoming a way more awesome man a way more awesome human but they're not stopping to appreciate that that's where the fulfillment comes from when you're right. operating in your highest power, it's yeah. like that's where that creativity comes from. That's where fulfillment comes from. Yes, we'll get the shiny toys. Yes, we'll get the financial rewards, of course. But that's not where the buzz comes from. That doesn't last. The buzz comes from like being able to look in the mirror and be proud of who we are and proud how we're, we're, we're flowing with more, more power. It's like... And we only is get that access clear to, to that. the men you work with that it's the process more than the destination or is that something that you i mean that's something that i help them recognize they've learned that whether consciously or unconsciously because they're achieved most of them have achieved some success already um yeah. and it just hasn't felt that good and i help them understand why and we find those parts that won't let them enjoy it you know sabotage yeah. comes from a very specific part of us and that part blocks our ability or blocks our ability to enjoy things. And when you speak to that part, you can turn it around and it changes everything. Say more about this part. So essentially, you know, so, so this work that I do with founders in the three pillars, we spend most of the time on the first pillar, which is mm -hmm. around coming back into peace with who you are. And most people aren't at peace with who they are because there's a bunch mm -hmm. of things that happened as they were growing up that were suboptimal. Mm -hmm. The truth is, most of us, even if we had really amazing parents, um, there were key moments, many moments, hundreds, sometimes thousands of moments where our needs were not met, sometimes because we had unrealistic expectations, but often because our parents were, lacked presence or lacked kindness or lacked capability or worse, you know, had, haven't solved their own trauma and were deeply wounding, aggressive or cruel. And most of us have got a variety of experiences that kind of, were awful even if you had an above average experience there's still probably a, a whole bunch of times which really knocked the wind out of ourselves in those moments especially when it's in relationship to our primary caregivers our parents a child is hardwired hardwired to believe that their parents are good and right because mm. if we get that our parents aren't good and right then the things we are dependent upon 
are not stable and therefore we would freak out, right? So it's more mm. terrifying. So we have a part in our brain, I call the protector, that protects us from this painful truth that our parents are failing us or flawed or fallible or worse. And it does that by saying, no, 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 their, their treatment of you is appropriate because they are right and good and perfect. Therefore, if their treatment of you is imperfect, therefore you must be the imperfect one. So we have this part in our brain that takes comfort in running us down, in lowering our perceived value. Uh, I saw a meme the other day which sums this up perfectly. It says, don't shout at your kids. They won't hate you. They'll hate themselves. Mm. And basically, most people who have imposter syndrome or self-sabotage have have a version of that, have a number of events, moments, or times, or a history of a childhood where their needs weren't met, they weren't honored, they weren't supported, they weren't possibly loved enough, or they were loved in ways that didn't work for them. And they internalize those failings as being their own. It gives them a sense of control, mm -hmm. but that becomes a narrative, which means they have to act out, play out, they have to sabotage, they have to push people away, they have to push projects away, they have to, um, they get in the way of their success. Or if despite all that success lands, they tell themselves it was a fluke or they would think that the rug's going to, someone's going to knock on the door and tell them to pack their bags any minute, all that stuff. And, you know, like when people win the lottery, like they get, end up in debt because their system just can't handle that narrative of them. And so they make terrible choices and disasters mm. happen. And so yeah. some of the clients that I get, are, are not from the founders themselves. It's from people who are investing in the founders. So I say to investors, like, go to your founders and ask them, pay them a compliment and see if they shirk it. Because if they shirk it, they're going to mess up your project and you're going to lose your money. Mm. So I've been training investors to, to spot their founders that they're investing in if they've got sabotage patterns because, you know, it's worth investing in me to get that sorted because otherwise that project it either isn't going to work or that founder will get it over the line, but they will implode in the process. They'll burn out, their relationships will fail, their addictions will go through the roof, or their health will fail. And it's like, again, so, that's so a there's problem. something. So there's something that you're reading from the simple act of somebody receiving a compliment and not being able to receive it. Yeah. And from that, you're like, you're following some kind of breadcrumb trail towards, okay, so these are going to mess up in all kinds of ways. What, what, what capacity is that? Is it that they don't have that, that makes it's, this? They have, yeah, they have a part inside that doesn't want them to feel good. It doesn't want them to feel good. So what I get people to recognize, and if you're listening to this and you think, ah, some people have learned how to receive a compliment externally because they know it's socially awkward if you don't. That's not the same thing as receiving a compliment. Receiving a compliment is, is, is truly receiving. And so people know if they struggle with that, if they struggle to receive praise or be recognized, they hand it over the credit over to other people or whatever. So what you want to focus on is there's this deep underlying feeling of I'm not okay, I'm not good enough, I don't deserve it, I, you know, I'm not that great. And you focus in on the kind of energy signature of that sensation, you want to ask yourself the question, is it that I believe that? Or is it that there is an energetic desire to believe that? Like this active like feeling of, I will push away these things. If someone was just low confidence or low self-esteem, if you paid them a compliment, they would gobble it up like a hungry man would eat a meal. Why would they push it away? They push it away because the emotional algebra is like, if you tell me I'm okay, then that means I was innocent and that I was deserving. That means, are you saying my parents let me down? So when you pay someone the compliment, you're literally saying, if their parents did let them down, your parents are bad people. And the child within hates that. It's like, no, 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 I'm a piece of shit. Don't give me the raise. I'm going to get a promotion. So I'm going to mess something up. You know, I'm going to create a disaster. I'm going to push this away. I'm going to mess it up. And people sabotage in all sorts of fascinating ways. So what fascinates me about what you're sharing now is first the idea that you're working with high achieving high performance men that probably are used to having respect from others. They they're used to having a certain level of authority with people mm -hmm. and here you show up 
and you're going to be like, yeah, we're going to look at your inner child. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how do you bridge those two worlds? How do they open up to you? Yeah, well, I, I don't necessarily use the word inner child early on. So I'm not, no, we may right. have just lost a bunch of your listeners, right? <laughs> so, but yeah. the, the, the yeah. truth is, you know, I say, you know, it's the most amazing, the techniques I've developed is quick. So it's not about sitting in therapy for three years, crying about your past, but it is about giving you the tools. So I teach all my clients the tools to go in. And I say, people say, are we not just opening a can of worms? I should just lock it down and crack on. It's like, no, 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 mm. we're not opening a can of worms. We're rescuing kids. We're rescuing frozen parts of your brilliance, your creativity, your excellence. I've just been in the States working with an incredible scientist. We've been integrating some of these lost and frozen parts of himself. And he's been asking those parts to give him insights on his experiments. And they have been designing new ways in which he can use his technology with him. And it's been taking him to the whole next level. So how I present it is this is about unlocking your potential because it is mm. these frozen parts of us who are very ready to blame ourselves. Once you integrate them, they just enable you to be a much more powerful version of yourself. So it's about, you know, I say to people, you know, if you've ever driven a manual car, you know, a stick shift, right? Mm. If you've ever been on a fast I, I only car, drive manual. I, I hate this. Cool, Ivan, you're a real man. Axe is in the back. <laughs> right? A reindeer on the roof. All right, like a true Viking. <laughs> so you know what it is. I'm sure you never forget to move from fourth gear to fifth gear. But if you've ever been on a fast road and you realize, oh, I haven't moved up a gear, right? And then you put it into fifth gear, right? And then the car just oh, eases forward. There's less mm -hmm. strain on the engine. There's, you're using less fuel, right? So I'm all about moving people into their fifth or sixth gear. And mm -hmm. that makes you more money. It makes things more easy. It takes the strain off your heart. It, it makes everything better. But the challenge I have is most people, especially a lot of the powerful men I work with, they, they think they're in fifth gear. And they think maybe I'll take them from fifth to sixth. I turn up and I'm like, with all love and respect, you're comparing yourself to your peers. You're not comparing yourself to your true potential. Really, you're tearing around town in second gear. And you could be having a much nicer time. You could be having way more time off. You could be waking way more money. And you could be much nicer to be around for your woman and your kids. You know, And it's like, yes, it involves looking at your trauma. Get the fuck over it. It doesn't matter. And it doesn't have to take a long time. And it's amazing. When you do it well, it's like you're getting, you become your own best friend. And that is the best. And then you feel great. And then you can handle the vicissitudes of modern life. You know, it's like the ups and downs. If you've got big plans, you've got big disappointments coming your way because it's brutal, right? Staff are, can be challenging. Government regulation can be challenging. Eco economic frustrations, the mayhem of the woke liberal madness that's causing all sorts of trouble in the world. These have an impact on business. And mm. um, you're always going to be ups and downs in business. But if, you've got right, if you're in right relationship with yourself, then uh, the resilience that comes from that is um, golden. And so for me, I, I convince them to see the, the, the value in what they're going to earn as a result. Right. Well, there's a profound realness in what you're imparting to these clients of yours and even to the listeners here today. And it's something around like, no, it's not supposed to be perfect. It's not supposed to be easy. And you're human, you're flawed. And actually one of the first and most important things that you, you have to do in order to get to the sixth gear is to actually accept your, your fallibility. This is what I'm getting. And, yeah. and so from, from there, and like, this is, this is, this was the key that opened, open your door, you know, to, to a higher octave of your masculine impact and expression. 100%. And so it's a, it's an interesting seeming paradox that you would get so much more power and so much more flow and perfection out of actually owning fully that, no, I'm fucking imperfect. You know, I, I make a lot of mistakes. I fumble. I forget things. I can't tie it my tie properly <laughs> whatever it is you know <laughs> all, all kinds of embarrassing things that we're all carrying around i'm not very good with tying and tying ties so mm -hmm. i mean, like old shirts and everything <laughs> so <laughs> well, we, we we have our things and that is like baseline i need to be okay with that is what you're saying 
Yeah, it's the beginning yeah. place. The first pillar is about coming to, into deep peace with who you truly are. And it's not about being great in spite of your past. It's actually being incredible because of it. It's like I see the part of our divine destiny is recognizing that all of that crap is waiting to be transformed into pure gold. You know, our mess is our message. And it's not an incidental thing that needs to be brushed under the carpet. It's something that has to be integrated into the very fabric of our mission. When yeah. you understand that everything that's happened to you is training for who you are destined to become, life becomes a gymnasium for your soul. It becomes a character gym. It's not meant to. We don't go to the gym and lift a bar with no weights on it. It's like there are meant to be struggles. That's what develops our character. It's not meant to be easy. We shouldn't even want it to be. It's about recognizing I'm signed up for development, for the greater good. And I've realized, you know what? It's not the output of these projects that I'm interested in. It's, it's in the becoming for the men who are, who, are, who are taking these projects on that we're a part of a singular field of consciousness, according to my mm. understanding and my beliefs. Mm -hmm. And the gift is not the output from your project. It, it, it is the transformation in your consciousness. It is in your family line, no longer being identified by, no longer like being defined by the, the trauma in your family story, but actually being refined by it and turning that into gold for consciousness with that you know the tide rises and all the boats go that little bit higher you know mm -hmm. this is our gift this is our philanthropy our freedom is our philanthropy will we then have great success and be charitable and donate money to good causes and donate time and yeah of course because when we get this stuff everyone becomes our brethren and we realize we're interconnected and it's just the right thing to do and it feels good and it's just a logical thing to do so we will be philanthropists we will be charitable but that's not the primary purpose our purpose is loving ourselves enough to create a life that we adore and having the courage to be honest about who we truly are that's enough that's you want personal development just do that you don't need to go on courses just commit to that that's the course that's that's what we that's why we're here and that's mm. no small thing. That's a that's a big thing. And with that as the base, loving ourselves as we are, accepting ourselves as we are, we don't even need to attach a particular kind of template or model to the steps that we take in the world. It should look a certain way. It's this amount of money. It's this kind of car. It's this kind of woman. It's this how many kids, whatever it is. Because mm. the baseline is somehow I have managed to come to peace with myself. Yeah. But I guess there is a little bit of a chicken and the egg here as well, that uh, the, to, to be able to do that with having no achievements in life mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. also kind of ridiculous. Yeah, agreed. I mean, so from one of the central, so one of the central things I do in pillar two, which is about how people connect to their power, it's about getting people to realize what is the shape of me? Like if I'm a particular tool in the divine toolbox, like what am I for? Like what's the shape of me? Where's my joy and my passion mm -hmm. to be found? But like, what is my, what, yeah, what am I here for? And we create this document called the declaration. And so I'll give you an example. Like if you, if people go on some of these like law of attraction workshops about bringing in your ideal partner, right? One of the things they'll do is they'll be like, I write a list of, her perfect attributes, you know, and like, what is she like? And it's like, it shouldn't just be physical stuff, but that will be there. It should also be like, how will she behave if your best friend hits on her when you're out of town? It's her character, like her integrity. Like you write this big list, right? But those workshops miss out on the biggest trick. It's like, okay, write that list, get a very clear vision of her, then embody her thinking and write her list. What's she looking for? Cause I'll guarantee you her list will be a DNA for who you are on your most awesome day, right? Be that guy. Then she's way more like, then that chick's way more likely to turn up. And more importantly, she's more likely to recognize that you're the kind of quality she's looking for. And more importantly, you walk around like that guy. It doesn't, if you stay celibate for the rest of your life, you don't care because being that guy will be satisfying enough. Hmm. So for me, I help people. People are all about, oh, you need to make a clear order to the in the in the like in the restaurant of life. I'm like, no, no, you need to be on the menu in the restaurant of life. You have mm. to be articulated as a delicious dish and you have to look good, feel good, you know. So it's about living in alignment with your values, being proud of who you are. Get that right, everything else will follow. And that can include having the nice house, having the nice cars, having the nice partner. That's beautiful. Enjoy that. But it doesn't doesn't come from focusing on that it comes from focusing on who is the guy that has that day mm. and that that can be done 
from rock bottom. You can be that guy today from how you turn up and how you deal with everybody. And, we, you know, it, that's, that's the key. It's not about doing it. It's about that state of being. And, you know, a 17-year-old who hasn't achieved anything in their life could listen to this and go, okay, I'm going to be that guy who has that life today by how I turn up today. Mm. I like to think of internal commitments that you may or may not be aware of. Mm -hmm. I don't particularly enjoy the frame of law of attraction because it feels no. naive and mental and very <laughs> bypassy. But very bypassy. Agreed. Yeah. So it's it's too easy and it doesn't work. You know, well, because it works. If it worked, 14 year old boys would be waking because the idea is visualize very vividly, feel in your body all the feelings associated with it. Okay. It's yeah. like, if that were true, 14 year old boys across the world would be waking up with porn stars in their bed, right? So, yeah, I just, I just think it's, uh, it's a weak frame. It yeah. had its moment, like a lot of people got taken by it, and a lot of people paid money to be, you know, robbed. Essentially, I don't think a lot of people had actual genuine results from this, but there was the, the, there is a close relative. And I think this is to some extent similar to what you're speaking of. It's like we have these internal commitments. And if, uh -huh. if you are a man, the world is a bit like a woman. And so if you want to like the etymology of commitment means something along the lines of bringing together. It's like a form of unity. So it actually indicates intimacy with something. Right. And so yeah. for me yeah. to be intimate with an external manifestation that is attractive to me, I need to then actually have an internal commitment that magnetizes that and is compatible with it. And yeah. if I don't have those manifestations in my life, then my internal commitments aren't the ones that I think that they are. And I need to actually reveal them and cover them and change them. And then yeah. so this is just my my frame, which is a bit different than yours. But but yes. I think we're saying the same thing. Agreed. Yeah, it's what I would call conjugate pairings. It's like we have to be a vibrational match, you know, and, and it's way yeah. more than that. And you'll hear some of that stuff on law of attraction, but this is way deeper because it's like you can't be in this deeply abundant state if you're still like full of resentment because of your past. You've got to clear the decks of that stuff or it won't work. And also you get it, yeah, like understanding what are you committed to and what how are you really yeah. behaving in alignment with that. And that's the problem. People aren't, aren't you know, good – freedom stuff or therapy or coaching is about making the unconscious conscious and you know socrates said it an unexamined life is no life at all and that's what he meant it's like you can't you can't live well if you're not paying attention to what the hell's going on inside you you know yeah do you think people in general are no i think people in general are not mm -hmm. let's let's look a little bit at this because we're we're approaching the end of our conversation here, Tom, and I like to I like to segue a bit here to this future timeline that is mm -hmm. spreading out in front of us. And there could be multiple timelines. Yeah. And and let's say that we can bring, be grandiose enough to take a bit of responsibility for the collective evolution of men. Mm -hmm. So what what is needed at this point you feel in order to write this mess of a ship that is this trapped in some storm in the middle of the pacific and we we don't know where we are and we're about to sink so yeah. what's needed i think i think in the world where there has been massive imbalance between masculine and femininity and masculinity mm -hmm. has been turning up um in, in ways that are toxic and femininity and even feminine empowerment has been turning up in ways that are toxic in alignment with toxic masculinity. What the world really requires is understanding the difference between true masculine power and true mm. feminine power. Many, many, many women have got empowered and they, they have become masculine and they have thought that is empowerment and that is not feminine power. And of course we have movements of those energies within us, of course. And this is not about men and women, but this is about understanding the true grace and beauty of both masculine and feminine power. And and I don't think that's well articulated, and I don't think it's in common mainstream. And then it's enabling people, giving people the tools 
to become conscious enough of their choices and their unconscious motivations so that they have a chance to actually align with their values. Problem is that so much, you know, for me now, spirituality and psychology are, are, are not connected. They're the same thing. And if you, if you only study psychology, but without spirituality, then you have the capacity to change behavior, but you're just going to change it towards materialistic, egotistical um, goals that no, don't serve the next version of humanity. Or if you have spirituality without psychology, then you have all these good intentions to be a decent human, but you have any ability to change your behavior. And so for me, it's like psychology without spirituality is hollow and spirituality without psychology is blunt. Can't do a damn thing. And it's In, for me, a blunt instrument. Blunt, is that what blunt. You mean? It's a blunt instrument. Yeah. It just doesn't work, you know? Mm. And so for me, it's understanding, understanding that those two things really are the same thing, like deep psychological understanding of how you have come to be who you are and, and truly understanding what will serve you moving forward. So that you have the mecha mechanics to, to make those necessary changes in how you're turning up. Let's get practical. Like, let's bring yeah. in one, like you said something that I, I'm, I'm going to challenge it a bit. You said it's not about men and women. Do you truly mean that? What I mean is, what I mean is it, it is not about the, the women are solely responsible for feminine power and men are solely responsible for masculine power. It's like, I have, there's an overlap, power. right? Yeah. There's an overlap and between I, men yeah. and masculine power and w women and, Feminine power. Yeah, feminine. and also man's power is grounded in the deep respect and reverence for understanding the value of feminine power and vice yes. versa. It's like we need to remove this idea of the the combat of these, like such a long period of time of, of trouble between the sexes and, and get back to a place of mutual reverence where both have equal value for the creation of the new world. Agreed, yeah. And, you know, Do you think we're so there? No, I think what I'm seeing emerging is some terrifying ideas in the world of masculine development, which is promoting an old world fairy tale view that the man has to be dominant and the woman has to be subservient. And I just think it's a massive backward step. They're co-opting what is the natural flow between men and women and turning it into a movement, which is making women expect to be completely looked after and they're not allowed to ever question their men. I mean, it's just a, yeah, that's a disaster waiting to happen. What, what's the biggest problem that you see with that? Well, I think it's actually a backdoor for like a like a like a very patriarchal um, oppression of feminine wisdom, and it creates a mm. space for men to be incredibly awful and not and for them not to be challenged. For them not to be challenged. I see wounded princes saying, I remember when I was in my 20s, when I was making love to a woman, if she gave me direction, I hated it because it knocked me off my game and I went into my head and I felt I wasn't good enough. And then I was like, please don't talk to me. I can't, I couldn't handle it. My little yeah. crown would fall up and it'd be all dented and I wouldn't feel good enough. And it, now it's like I, I'm robust enough to get guidance and I want to be able to serve and I want to be kidding. It's like, they're, they're promoting this idea of masculinity, which is like, you can't ask questions, you can't direct them, you can't invite them to think about doing things differently. It's encouraging women that if you're just pretty enough and funny enough and non-challenging enough and, and effusive enough, then your man will be a decent enough human to know what you need and therefore you should never tell him and never direct him and never pull him up on his failings. It's like, mm. wow. This is just like creating a space for men just to be like terrified and weak mm. actually and and i think it's a complete yeah. it, it underneath it is this idea that women in their power have just got no value whatsoever they're just there to like enable a man to feel powerful it's like wow that is not the point so it's very dangerous yeah. but it's very 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 um seductive because for women it's like i'm going to be rescued by a daddy king and for these mm. wounded princes I'm just going to be adored eternally and I'm just going to get constant validation. And my woman's just going to applaud me as I walk around the house providing, you know, it's like bloody hell. This is not, <laughs> this is not a forward step, you know? Yeah. What's your take on feminine and masculine leadership? Do, do you feel like there's a, there's a natural relationship here? Does one lead the other? Does masculine lead feminine? Does feminine lead masculine? 
You know, the thing I see, you know, in the world is just this constant, like, pendulum swinging of, mm -hmm. like, this attempt to define an, a hierarchical system. And where it's like nature is a spiral. It's seasonal. And it's like you could say, oh, well, it's summer more dominant than winter, you know? It's summer dominant than winter. And it's like, well, it depends which way you look at it. But actually, if you think of it as a cycle or a seasonal it's it's really not helpful it's a very it's a very mechanical cartesian way of thinking around cause and effect and it's really problematic it speaks to the primary western problem it's like no no it's like masculine sky god feminine earth mother you know it's like wow the wisdom of the earth and the truth and the grounded embodied wisdom of the frailty of emotion and the truth and then my ability in the masculine spirituality to be utterly transcendent in the oneness and nothing matters and everything's perfect and it all fits together and human suffering is an illusion. And it's like, we need both of those. They're both equally true. And, and we need to be able to hold both. And, and the feminine grounds the masculine in the real truth of what's fundamental and important and valuable. And the masculine holds us in this wide expansive state of like universal and unconditional love. And it's like, it's like, oh, it's like the love of the human and the love of spirit and how they intersect. It's like, no, my partner and her menstrual cycle and her relationship to nature constantly grounds me in a perspective that enriches my understanding of what the kingdom needs and what I'm providing for and why I'm providing for it. Because I can lose connection to the ground and completely lean over to overdoing. I'll work the land far too hard. I'll work myself far too hard. I could easily rip the resources out of the earth for what I consider to be the greater good of ever increasing development. And the wisdom of the feminine just brings us back and understands that we should be living and protecting the next seven generations with our choices. It's that deeper embodied wisdom, including the frailty of our most tender parts. It's like we need both. They're equal, but they have different roles. Mm -hmm. So you're painting a, pic a picture of a much more nuanced narrative around masculine and feminine. Mm. Mm. And it's really important, you know, and I see, I see, you know, you see these pendulum swingings, you know, I walk past the, you know, I walk, walk past the comedy club years ago and it's like all black comedy club, comedy night with only, only black comedians. And it's like, mm. well, I wouldn't be able to say all white comedy night. And, and uh, like, like what, you know, and it's, and, and, and I understand that oppressed minorities um, want to rebalance so that they have a place and they have a voice and they're, they're included and they're, they're prioritized as a rebalancing force. I understand all of that. And yet an yeah. enlightened world would be heading for where the pendulum stops in the middle. And I understand this where is, healing um, along the way. Yeah, this is true. One of the things that hear, I... Uh, you'll, hear, you'll hear people saying, oh, you know, we just need to get rid of all the men and the women should run the world. And it's like, we had that before. We had matriarchal societies. If it worked brilliantly well, and then it would have continued. Of course, there was imbalances in that. There are this, you know, the the one touch, what you know, the um, the orgasmic meditation woman, you know, head of a massive thing. She's, you know, she's a massive lead of an organization. There's, there's terrible things happening in that organization. You know, it's like, no, we don't need all female leadership. We definitely don't need all masculine leadership. We need a tribe that has some very wise grandmothers keeping an eye on the crazy male warriors. And we need some, you know, the elders. The elders are the key because they no longer need to, they no longer need to be political. They're no longer trying to breed. They've got enough money. They're protected. Oh. They're provided for. They no longer need to be polite, you know? It's the eldership we need. And we need wise old women and we need wise old men reminding us of what's important. Yeah. So finally, then, if if you're a young man today, what what does he need to know about women and the feminine and his relationship to it? Mm. I think one piece of advice I'd say to see, see every woman as your grandmother, your mother, and your sister, just in terms of respect and in principle reverence to dissolve mm. the kind of objectification that women are not here for to serve your pleasure. Mm. And, and the greatest way 
to have the best relationship with 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 women is to be in your integrity and your honor what i have seen the sexual and relational circuitry of the feminine is absolutely lit up when a man is visibly in their integrity and their honor that's what the world needs that's what women need and then women will start trusting men and they'll start raising their men and instead of trying to turn them into little women they will they will turn them into good men so many men who have got hurt by the feminine have been hurt by because they've been raised by women who are incredibly angry with men and vice versa and it keeps going and it keeps cycling and and yeah it's the reverence from both sides the reverence from both sides there's there really is beauty to masculine energy and there really is beauty to feminine energy and we need both mm. and so it's understanding what that is and why it's valuable uh because our culture really has messed around with those so I'd I'd be like go deep on learning about masculine energy and feminine energy and and uh and 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 trust that it's not about dominance. Mm. Your your magnificence will magnetize interest in ways where you will not need to be dominant. It might look mm. like you have power and dominance because of the way in which your partner is so like supportive and surrendered into your glory. But you are surrendered and reverent in her glory for she is the light that inspires you to be your very best it's an equality there that has to be seen it's not one leading the other mm. what do you love about being a man tom when i have integrated new levels of integrity I realize how tiring and how scary it is when I'm out of my integrity not because being integrity gives me extra control but it gives me that relationship to myself when all the wheels fall off and there's just me on my own looking in the mirror I at least have that peace that peace and so it is the peace of virtue itself and i'm not there i'm working towards it but the more that i can operate from that place of honor integrity honor my partner my children my family and everything that i do and i'm not letting myself down i'm not worrying about something being found on my phone i'm not worrying about someone finding a message or something dodgy occurring it's a peace that comes from that which gets addictive and i am loving finding my way to honor the truth of me so that any one in my life could walk into a room I'm in and my head wouldn't drop in shame i could look everyone in the eye that doesn't mean cuz i've done a great job but where i haven't i've done my best to reach out to those people clean it up and and get back to yeah being accountable and that to me has been amazing cleaning up my mistakes so that i could be in any room and any one from my past could walk into it and i wouldn't i wouldn't dim my eyes or drop my head Great. I care a lot about integrity myself, so I totally know what you're talking about. Uh last question. Well, actually I have two more questions. Uh but uh, the the question I want to ask you is if the men who are listening to this conversation were gathered in a room now and you you had that room and you got to give them one instruction a piece of advice a thing to do and you knew that they had 100% implementation of that thing what mm -hmm. would you tell them i honestly believe the biggest problem in the world is that we are well, there is a part inside all of us that is opposed to our greatness mm -hmm. and instead of fighting that part learning how to identify it and and integrate it with love so that it's on your side in ways that are productive because it's on your side in ways that are limiting once you transform that part your life will be transformed and everybody has that to some degree my greatest recommendation is everybody goes on a journey to to find that part and negotiate with it with love feel the truth of what it's been protecting you from the disappointments of your past recover your innocence and let that lead your integrity follow that as a compass and and your life will get immeasurably better Mm. Great. Well, finally, Tom, if somebody uh, has watched this and feels inspired and lit up by your message, where can they find more information? 
Yep. So it's just my name, Tom Fortismayor.com. I'll print that on the screen, but you've written a couple of books as well. Absolutely. Yeah. If you search for my name on Amazon, you'll see my books are there. So both published. Which by one are you most proud of? Which one would you uh, recommend? Oh, the, yeah, the, uh, the free mind experience, the three pal the three pillars of absolute happiness for me, that really lays out, um, I mean, I've revised it since 2013 when I wrote that book, but it's still, yeah. it is absolutely packed full of nuggets that will help you have a better life. Good. Thank you, Tom, for being a guest on the Way Showers podcast. I appreciate it. Oh, my it's absolute fun. pleasure. Thank you so much. And for those of you who have watched or listened, uh, thank you for coming along for this conversation. I hope you enjoyed it and that you got some nuggets and maybe some things that you feel inspired to implement right away. And of course, don't hesitate to reach out to Tom. I'm sure he will be excited to hear from you. So I'll see you again in the next Way Showers episode. Hope you have a great day. I'll talk to you soon. Hey brother, so before I wrap up today, I want to leave you with an invitation. In these past many conversations with these inspiring leaders in the field of men's work, one theme has started to crystallize and that theme is commitment. You have to be committed to your growth, you have to be committed to your own expansion, you have to be committed to your family, to your children, to your wife, girlfriend, partner, you have to be committed to your health, you have to be committed to your purpose, to your finances. You need to be committed in many dimensions of life in order for you to rise towards glory. Now I speak about these dimensions as clarity, courage, connection and creation. And the fifth dimension of commitment is what makes these other four rise to glory. So when all of that happens beautifully, commitment permeating clarity, courage, connection and creation, you become a five-dimensional man of thriving. That's how I like to talk about it. And when you don't permeate your life with commitment, clarity becomes confusion, courage becomes cowardice, connection becomes conflict, and creation becomes consumption. And that is truly a very unholy life, a life of depression, a life of anxiety, a life that you probably do not want to live. And there is a place where you can work on developing these five dimensions of your life. And that place is the Ground and Glory Guild. Now this guild is a place where you will meet many men who are committed to, while well, deepening their commitment through life's daily battles. They are committed to thriving in these five dimensions. You will also experience powerful trainings various challenges. You will have a training on deepening your commitment. You will have a training on finding your true north because without having a clear idea of where you're going, where your true north is, what will you commit to? It's unclear, isn't it? You will have access to powerful tools and weapons of expansion. I call them the armory so that you will have the kind of support that you need in order to thrive in these dimensions. You will also gain access to accountability structures with these other men who are guild members with you. And I encourage you to take uh, this opportunity now because you can get in for only $22 per month before the price increases to $33 per month. You will have access to a seven day free trial in order to just sample this place. So if this sounds like a sweet deal, like something that can help you become a five-dimensional man who thrives in these difficult times, then go to groundandglory.com and join us now. I'll see you on the inside.